Author David Morrell probably had absolutely no intention of seeing his thriller that he started in 1968 get put up on the big screen, let alone spawn a franchise that would span 34 years. Part of this was because his original book, First Blood, saw John J. Rambo actually die at the end of his page turner rather than surrendering quietly after an emotional breakdown. This alone was one of the first major changes in battle plans for the iconic role of Stallone's that didn't wear boxing gloves. One that would lead him down a long road of increasing body counts, biceps and bullets, which became a far cry from the scarred Vietnam vet that we were originally introduced to. But why the adjustment? What was it that led to Stallone's serious outing as John J. Rambo transform into a one-man army that even Arnie had competition with? To go from battle scarred to battle ready and back again, how did it all come about? I'm Tom from Screen On Point and we've got our sights set on how Hollywood changed John Rambo. To conjure a typical image of Rambo John Jay is to imagine the 80s personified. Flowing locks, a body wrapped in veins that look like near exposed wiring, and a bandana to keep the sweat falling into the eyes of a killer who aims a gun like he's firing a t-shirt cannon. However, the die-hard fans of the franchise know not that one will mostly lean towards a different version, a reserved and worn down underdog that has more baggage than than Stallone's Italian Stallion counterpart ever could, and rightfully so. First Blood, unlike the sequels that followed, had every intention of being a performance-driven thriller rather than a popcorn-fueled action movie. But even then, this was a slightly different take than from the source. Morell explained that his idea came from his time working as a professor at the University of Ohio, seeing both Vietnam veterans attend his classes and reading news stories of the hippie culture being shunned and attacked in the street in their attempt to bring in the age of peace and love. These details developed in to a story that he described as the Vietnam War coming home to America. It depicted Rambo as a much more bloodthirsty character, a lethal weapon that took 16 lives in his story, making his ultimate demise somewhat acceptable. So before he became the man we know, various names were being thrown around for the role, the likes of Steve McQueen, Al Pacino and Dustin Hoffman getting a mention for the role of Rambo. However, McQueen was too old for a Nam vet, Pacino wanted crazier and Hoffman deemed the character are far too violent. All were eventually scratched off the list when Sly enlisted, adding his star power and his writing hand to the mix. And here began a volume of drastic changes being applied to show the legendary Green Beret in a slightly different light. No longer Morel's military monster, instead Rambo was a man returning to a society he'd fought for that he couldn't find a place in. A familiar perspective from a veteran that had been explored in other films like Taxi Driver and Deer Hunter, which were only in the early stages of riding their own social impact. Here we had another severe casualty haunted by flashbacks of the war over there which quickly turns into a film fitting somewhere between The Fugitive and Deliverance, with Rambo taking to the world and attacking with all the intensity of a 70s slasher villain. The ferocity was actually chopped down from 3 hours to 90 minutes after the observation of Sly himself. He deemed his performance in the role unwatchable to the point where he and his agent felt sick after a first viewing. Following talks with the film's director Ted Kotcheff, the decision of cutting Rambo's first misadventure down to a lean hour half paid off, and actually led to a winning result and ultimately a lap time that action films would aim towards going forward as a result. While it may not be held within the same league as some of that era's vietnam fueled films, First Blood was another testament to prove that when he felt like it, Stallone could really act. It was present in the first Rocky but was starting to wane by round 3 that saw him up against Mr T's Club of Lang, but First Blood gave him the opportunity to stretch those acting muscles again while only briefly showing the ones that had been glistening in his recent search for Eye of the Tiger. Here this quiet and confused war vet instead is one bubbling with rage and fear of the world he's come back to. Though it was met with some mixed reactions from critics, the box office disagreed as Rambo's slowly stewing debut installment that cost 15 million left with 125 million and the constant positive response was aimed directly at Stallone's performance as well as Richard Crenner who was actually a last minute choice. Originally Brian Dennehy's sheriff and his power hungry lawmen were going to be educated on what they were up against by Kirk Douglas, who got as far as signing on the dotted line for the film before pulling out last minute. Spartacus got the boot and Krenner got the call for the role instead, and within a week of the offer, he was on set having his lines recited to him before memory 
would kick in and he'd deliver a number of iconic quotes that made Colonel Troutman as memorable as the one-man army he'd helped build. Are you telling me that 200 men against your boy is a no-win situation for us? You send that many, don't forget one thing. What? A good supply of body bags. And this relationship was crucial not only for the film's emotional finale, but a chemistry that would continue for two more chapters and one of the few consistent elements of the Rambo franchise because while the soldiers stayed the same, the was Rambo was sent to fight would change dramatically. The broken man we met would be rebuilt, rebranded, and ready for action in a battle that made the small police department of Hope Washington look like pissed off security guards. Rambo was going back in the thick of it and maybe he'd get to win this time thanks to a little help from James Cameron. An up and comer at the time, Cameron was still reeling from the miserable gig he had with Piranha 2 and was hard at work with not just one, but two scripts that would change his career and the face of cinema as we know it. Splitting his office up with three separate work desks, the man who'd eventually become the self-proclaimed king of the world was at that point scribbling down the story of both the Terminator and Ripley's return in Aliens. Sandwiched in between cyborgs and Space Creatures was First Blood Part 2, a story that was recalibrating the tone of what Rambo was to what he would actually become. Gone was the triggered former soldier who didn't want to be pushed, instead here was the cold-blooded killing machine that was being sent right back into the breach that birthed him. It was a route that Cameron would go down not only with Alien sending Ripley back to LV-426, but also, unbeknownst to him at the time, the Terminator when Judgment Day arrived, sending the titular artificial assassin back for the side of good this time. Cameron also made time to squeeze in some supporting characters as well, including a plucky young tech whiz and a bunch of POWs that actually had something to say than just getting dragged out of hell by their lord and spectacularly fit saviour. However, Stallone wasn't on the same page. Like First Blood before it, he saw it as a vehicle to get political, highlighting the issue of the recorded 2,500 soldiers that were still missing from Vietnam while shooting scores of local soldiers and members of the Red Army in between. Tonally, it was all over the place. Rambo was switching from PTSD wreck to simply P.O.'d. And taking down anyone that wasn't American, besides his cringeworthy love interest who was killed off simply to raise the rage level. He wasn't some scrawny, terrified loner fighting for his life, he was fighting for the Star Spangled Banner and anyone that tried to oppose it, leading him to a final speech that while a bit more coherent than First Blood, had everything but the national anthem and a bald eagle resting on John's marble cut shoulders. Regardless of its message or the top score massacre, First Blood Part 2 received scathing reviews and Razzie wins for worst picture, actor and screenplay. But hey, what did the critics know, right? The love for Rambo among fans remains strong with none other than the acting president, Ronald Reagan, being vocal about his love for John Jay's tactics. Eating up the pro-war, all-American hero, Reagan often referred to Rambo's endeavors during public events at home or even, even intense real life hostage negotiations. And in the spirit of Rambo, let me tell you, we're going to win this time. Stallone's lethal one-man weapon was being all he could be, and that's exactly what America was relishing in, ultimately adding fuel to an already raging competitive fire between Stallone and his action icon equal, Arnold Schwarzenegger. They might be friends now, but Stallone has admitted on a number of occasions that he and the Austrian Oak did not see eye to eye from the off. Back when Sly was stepping onto the scene with his award-winning underdog tale Rocky, so too was the recent Mr. Olympia who had Hollywood in his waffle iron-sized palm. It was at the Golden Globes where the two were seated with each other and the sparks of competition began to fly. Schwarzenegger carried himself like he was the biggest person in the room and nine times out of ten, that was literally the case. And here he was laughing at every loss thrown Stallone's way for his brave new endeavor about the Philadelphian fighter, but it was when they announced Rocky as best pitcher that Sly threw the first punch, or petal at least. And then finally with Rocky best picture, I managed to grab this giant bowl of flowers and heave it in his direction. Yes. And oh yeah, I had lilies and tulips. I'm telling you, gauntlet is done. Yeah. <laughs> and this began a 10 year battle royale. Wow. I mean, we couldn't stand to be in the same galaxy. After bouts between boxers and barbarians, cyborgs against uh, <laughs> country singers, 
The competition reached its peak in 1985 when audiences were spoiled with not only First Blood Part 2 and Rocky IV, Stallone's second attempt to make peace with Russia by pummeling Dolph Lundgren, but Arnie's alternative of one-man war movies, Commando. What will go down in history as one of the biggest pissing contests in cinema history came from John Matrix's rescue mission being unintentionally moulded by John Rambo's trip back to Nam. As it turns out, Commando director Mark L. Lester nipped out during filming and managed to get a glance at Stallone's sequel while filming Arnie's latest, leading to an immediate change in tactics in every possible way. Speaking to Empire in 2010, screenwriter Stephen Souza said that during the shoot, Mark, the director, saw a sneak preview of Rambo and realised how many people get killed in that. He said, we've got to have a bigger dick than Rambo, we've got to slay more people. And suddenly, there were 150 extras getting killed, it got out of control. This was another outside element that was integral to the new trajectory Rambo was on and would continue to be steered towards. That wandering stranger from the first chapter may as well have gone the way of Morel's original iteration because with the competition that was continuing to explode on the silver screen between Sly and Arnie, the only option for Rambo was to go big or go home and Stallone chose the former. By part three, John was neither the forgotten hero nor the harbinger of doom. He was an action figure to be placed here there and anywhere Russians were causing trouble and respond in the most explosive, excessive way imaginable. Here is where we got Stallone's heavy armed hero reaching heights that even Arnie was struggling to meet, returning in what at the time was the most expensive film ever made. But could you really put a price on freedom? No, apparently that gift was obtained through driving tanks into helicopters, shooting arrows from that iconic bow, and enacting Stallone's take on Lawrence of Arabia by way of the Soviet-Afghan War. More than the rest, Rambo 3 now stands as somewhat of a time capsule of a film. A story that saw our leading man take out tough Russians in a conflict that in reality, they'd actually abandoned weeks before the film premiered. Of course, it didn't matter though. When the dust settled and the Red Army was defeated once again, Rambo and the rescued Colonel Troutman, who actually had something more to do than be our hero's hype man this time around, rode off into the sunset, seemingly to be never seen again. The exit wasn't met as poorly as the previous film, yet it still wasn't a patch on the founding first instalment. But it wasn't trying to be. Stallone was fully embracing the action-packed package he'd been boxed into, but breaking out of it proved difficult and almost became a career coffin as the years went by. Going from here onto what many thought was the final chapter of Rocky before making back-to-back -back cult favourites like Cliffhanger and Demolition Man, things soon began to spiral southwards for Sly. The battle of the box office continued to sway in Arnie's direction before the action genre started to sharpen up and Sly struggled to do the same with the likes of The Specialist, Assassins and Daylight, landing himself a trio of turkeys with Get Carter, Driven and Detox at the start of the millennium. But the same couldn't be said for the Austrian Oak or the third founding father of fucking film henchman up Bruce Willis. Both would reprise their roles as the Terminator in Rise of the Machines and John McClane in Live Free or Die Hard respectively. This resurgence of favoured franchises led Stallone to do the same, not only stepping back in the ring with resounding success as Rocky Balboa, but also take up the hunting knife once again as John Rambo in the cleverly titled and ridiculously grisly Rambo. If First Blood Part 2 and Rambo 3 were prime cut 80s action flicks, Rambo was a claret coated display of what Stallone could do in the noughties now that audiences had toughened up by the way of body horror like Saw and Hostel, as well as war films that were trudging through the trenches made by Saving Private Ryan. Back at the writing desk and the director's chair, Stallone tussled with trying to find a new battlefield John could call home, given the political climate surrounding Afghanistan, the very place the last Rambo ended in tribute to. To go after terrorists would have been a poor move. Action films were now focusing on tracking down an unknown enemy which involves surveillance and close quarter combat. Matt Damon had been born and gone just the previous year and comic book heroes were turning a new page with the likes of the Dark Knight trilogy and Iron Man landing the same year. This was all something that the hulking Matt Stallone post Rocky Balboa would have struggled with. So instead he settled for touching a good old fashioned gunfight down in Burma, a land ravaged by war that America had no part in but Rambo could be planted without risk of backlash when he emptied a machine gun on the terrain and anyone carrying a firearm. 
and the choice proved to be a solid one. Stallone finally did the unthinkable by capturing the solemn soldier with no water fight and finding one to finish in visceral fashion, hitting the target fans of the bone arrow welding warrior were fond of, as well as those that missed the serious and somber Stallone performance that captivated us in First Blood. Just like before though, the danger didn't seem to be closing in on Rambo. Instead, that defined brow remained unaffected by the horrors of babies being shot, stabbed and thrown into fires, shredding into realistic territory that would have been unthinkable decades earlier. It's war, it's what we do, he says to the band of trigger-happy mercenaries that seem to walk straight out of their own action movie and into this one. But as Stallone, with very little restraint, went on to show what they do wasn't very nice. The visuals detailing the horrors of war, both in documentary footage in the film's opening and Rambo's retaliation to the mean old Burmese soldiers was harrowing, with Stallone looking like he'd shot up a jam factory after mounting an MG by the end of it. For the war-hungry hero lovers, it filled the quota and then some, but just like Rocky Balboa, Stallone embraced that time had taken its toll on Rambo more than any skirmish had. He was now the trigger-friendly sage leading young bloods into battle, teaching them to stop living for nothing and risk dying for something, which was precisely the territory Morel had always envisioned for his take on Rambo, and even he admits is the closest version of the character from the book he'd seen since the beginning. Hopefully this is the take that makes the transition into what certainly sounds like Rambo's last outing with Final Blood, one chipped away by Hollywood's now forgotten hunger for clean cut shirtless heroes, competition with Austrian oaks and praise from presidents. Troutman was right, Rambo has gone full circle and what a road it's been. Thanks so much to Nick, not the bees, not the bees, Staniforth for writing this piece. You can follow him on Twitter at Nick Staniforth. And thanks so much to Tech and Tom MJ Moore for editing it. You can follow him at Tom MJ Moore. Thanks for watching that video. Please do like and subscribe. We upload two tasty and tenderized videos a week to sink your teeth into. And do let us know your thoughts in the comments. Make sure to follow us at Screen On Point and Tom A. Rantum on Twitter to satisfy my narcissistic need for acceptance and love. And you make sure you have a wonderful day.